Hi everyone, my name is Peggy Mason. I'm a professor of neurobiology at the University of Chicago. Some of the students here who are active in our neuro club have asked me to do an online dissection in these days of COVID when we cannot gather in person or not, not easily. And so what you'll see sandwiched between this and a wrap up at the end is a dissection of both sheep and human brains. And the design, what I've designed this to do is to introduce you to the parts of the brain, the hindbrain, the midbrain, the forebrain, and also to give you an idea of how this 3D structure wraps itself around and fits within the cranium. Okay, let's get started. When we think about neuroanatomy, we have to start with development. I'm gonna start on the chalkboard. We're gonna be here for about five, 10 minutes. Then we're gonna to go to sheep brains and human brains. Okay, so um, the nervous system develops from a tube. And this tube starts where this is the head. and this is the tail end. Uh, we're gonna pick the tube up at this point. This is about um, day 28 in the human, day 28 of gestation. And this is the forebrain. This is the midbrain. This is the uh, hindbrain. And this is the spinal cord. And each one of these swellings is called a vesicle. So this is the three vesicle stage. And then we go to something called the four vesicle stage. And that is when the forebrain actually divides. And so what it does is it does this. So we still have the spinal cord, we still have hindbrain, we still have midbrain. And now the forebrain is split into two parts that don't have English names. So they only have uh, more Latin or more uncommon names. This is called the diencephalon and this is called the telencephalon. So let's just take for a minute and see what all of these different parts are going to come are going to be come in the in the adult. This is a this is now you know thirty some day old uh, embryo in the human. So the hindbrain is going to become the medulla, the pons, and the cerebellum. And the midbrain is going to become the midbrain. The diencephalon is going to become the thalamus. Plus one other important thing. One thing that happens from the diencephalon is that there's this outpouching. And that outpouching grows and grows and grows. And then it does this. And it talks to... Uh, a placode that makes something, makes the lens of the eye. And these two talk back and forth. That's one of the things that happens in development. And this is gonna become the retina. And this is going to become the optic nerve. So what that means is this is the central nervous system. Spinal cord, hindbrain, midbrain, diencephalon. Diencephalon is continuous with the retina and the optic nerve. That means the retina and the optic nerve are part of the central nervous system. That's a big deal. That means when you look through the pupil to somebody's retina, you are looking at the central nervous system. This is not part of the brain because, the, because if we think about the way the um, human nervous system looks, or the mammalian nervous system looks, 
This is the spinal cord. It's in the vertebral column. This is the brain and it's in the cranium. And then this thing comes out from back here and goes to the orbit. So the orbit contains the retina. It's not part of the brain, but it is part of the central nervous system. So it's very important. That's why people are always interested in looking at people's eyes. If you see somebody that um, might have something going on with their, with their brain, such as a loss of consciousness, altered consciousness, uh, confusion, that kind of thing. Okay. So then we come to the telencephalon. This is going to become cortex, which has two big pieces. One is called the hippocampus. That's a, a three-layered cortex. And then neocortex, which is only found in mammals. It also has uh, the core structures of the basal ganglia, which are the striatum and the pallidum, and it has a structure called the amygdala, and a few other things, but those are the main things that are in the telencephalon. Okay, so now we're going to look at Uh, what happens to the telencephalon. So the telencephalon does not look like this for very long. What happens is that it, it invaginates down the middle and forms two telencephalic hemispheres. These are gonna become the two cerebral hemispheres, the left and the right uh, hemispheres of the brain. And that's going to connect to the diencephalon, which is going to connect to the midbrain, which is going to connect to the hindbrain, which is going to connect to the spinal cord. So this is telencephalic right, telencephalic left. And if we were, I mean, there are not too many vertebrates that look this way. There are a few that kind of look like this. A few of them, a few of the marine animals, marine vertebrates you can see this basic structure, but pretty quickly within the vertebrate line, the telencephalon gets very, very hungry for space. And so what happens is that it grows in every possible direction. So it grows forward, it grows to the side, and it grows backwards and it grows towards the middle. So it does an enormous, what I call an enormous comb over. So if we're looking from the side, and here's the spinal cord, here's the hindbrain, midbrain, diencephalon. And if the telencephalon were, were a nice, um, well-behaved part of the brain, it would just look like that, but it doesn't. So what it does is it comes back over, it comes down and around, it's, it's enormous. And it just links up to the diencephalon in, in one little spot. There's this huge comb over, which is why when you look down on a mammalian brain, what you're looking at is telencephalon. And the only, and do you see any diencephalon? No, covered by the telencephalon. Do you see any midbrain? No, covered by the telencephalon. Do you see hindbrain? A little bit. You can see, depending on, on the animal and depending on quite your exactly your view, you might see the cerebellum a little bit. And the cerebellum is part of the hindbrain. But for the most part, we're not seeing it because telencephalon got too hungry and, and ate up all the space. Okay, big comb over. Now, two, two other points. If we, if this is all that happened, let's imagine that we took a section like that, a coronal section 
going like that. What would we think we were going to see? Well, we think we're going to see the diencephalon. Okay, that's in the middle. And then as we come out here, what we're seeing is the folded over telencephalon. So we would see telencephalic right, telencephalic left, and diencephalon. And these are just all little independent pieces floating off from each other. That's not how it works because there are two big attachments that happen. One connects the two hemispheres, and that is called the corpus callosum. Not sure about that spelling. And the second one is a fiber tract that comes down and just physically forms a join here between the telencephalon and the diencephalon. And this fiber tract is called the internal capsule. And it contains information that's going down from the, from the cortex. Cortex is gonna to talk to either the midbrain, hindbrain, or to the spinal cord or to both. Um, and then there's a little bit of information going from, it, it, there's also information in the internal capsule going from the giant cell phone or from the thalamus back up to the cortex. But most of this information is going down. The only information that goes up here is from the thalamus. Okay, so what is this space? This space is the same as this space. Okay, it's outside of the brain. It's, for, it's a space that's not part of the brain. It's, it's the space that's formed by the comb over. Okay, are there any questions so far? So this is a good time to ask questions and then we're gonna dive right into the, into the brains and you'll see this stuff. Um, if you want to unmute and ask a question, or if you want to put it in the chat, I can read them off. Any questions so far? No? I think there's a question in chat. Let's see. Okay, just go for it. Um, where does the diencephalon connect to the telencephalon? So the diencephalon, good question. So the diencephalon connects to, let, let's do it here. Um, it turns out this, is, this point here, this rostral point, but on the midline, this is called the lamina terminalis. And that is the one place of connection. That's the one place of connection between the telencephalon and the diencephalon and until this attachment here. Okay, but this is if you're if you try to if you want to take off, and I have done this in the past, um, I think I don't think we're gonna to get to it today, but um we can do this in another version of this, hopefully without these damn masks. Um, uh, you can take the entire telencephalic cap off and you'll take it off. And what you'll see below is diencephalon, midbrain, hindbrain, all lined up. Okay. Any other questions? That space between the diencephalon and telencephalon, is there a name for that or is it important? Um, I, I will never tell you that something's not important. Uh, it is called the vellum interpositum. Okay, 
That's that's this space. And it, it actually stops right here at the right here. Um, actually, I have that wrong. It stops right here um, at the pineal gland. The pineal gland is this is right at the rostral edge of the um, midbrain. So I actually I think we, we have a there we can look at our pineal gland. They have a pineal gland here. Okay, so I think what we'll do is we'll start with a human mid sagittal section. Um, you want to come closer now. Okay, so this is going to allow us to, to just go over what we just learned. Just trying. Can you get this so that it's really not me? We don't need me. We need. Oh, yeah, and it's oriented correctly. Okay, great. So here is the brain. This is the front. This is the back, and this is actually the left hemisphere. If you can see that. The right hemisphere is right here. It's, it's been removed. So we're looking at the left hemisphere. And as we look at it from the side, all we see is telencephalon. This is all cortex. As you, as you are probably aware already, the telencephalon has these sulci and gyri. Sulci are these valleys and gyri are the hills. And uh, that's to give it more surface area because cortex is a surface structure and you want a lot of space for um, cortex, for neocortex in particular. And so this is all telencephalon and this is the cortex of the cerebellum. This also, you might see that it has its folds too. They're not called sulci and gyri, they're called folia. But it's the same idea and there's a cortex in the cerebellum as well. Um, and so this is hindbrain and this is telencephalon. And from the side in the human brain, you cannot see anything else. You don't see medulla, you don't see pons, you don't see midbrain and you don't see diencephalon. And that's the beauty of a mid sagittal section is that you can see that. So here's telencephalon, here's our comb over. This is the, uh, this is the um, corpus callosum. I don't know if you can see, but it's it's a it's a big fiber tract. It's just axons going in this way from one hemisphere to the other hemisphere. This thing down here, this right here, is the thalamus, and it ends right there. That's the thalamus. Just this little bit. If we go down here, that's the, this is the one edge, this little brown circle here. Do you see that? Can people see that? Do you think people can see that, Cassie? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, can you get closer? Okay, so this is the um, mammillary bodies. This is, the, this is the edge of thalamus to midbrain. This is thalamus, this is midbrain. That's the mammillary bodies. These are what, these disintegrate in advanced um, alcoholism with, in a syndrome called Korsakoff syndrome. The definition of the thalamus or of the diencephalon in fact, is that it connects to a major uh, hormonal gland, the pituitary. And this is where that connection takes place. What you might be able to see is that there's also a, this big fiber tract right here that the connection is right here. So this is the optic nerve. Here's where it connects to the pituitary. And when you get a pituitary adenoma, Scott Hamilton was a, is a, well, he used to be a skater. Now he's a retired skater. And he's had a, um, he's had a couple of recurring of pituitary adenomas. There's also a great book called um, Brand New Catastrophe by Mike Scalise that talks about a pituitary adenoma, in his case, one that secreted growth hormone. 
And one of the things that happens if you get these is that you get visual disturbances. And that's why, because the pituitary sits right here in a little cup of bone and it only has one way, way to go. It expands and expands right into the optic nerve and makes the optic nerve not do its job. So here is a thalamus. And then this pit piece right here, this little wedge from here to here, this is midbrain, tiny little midbrain. And then we're on to uh, we're on to hindbrain, and hindbrain has three parts. This is the pons, this is the medulla, and this is the cerebellum. The pons and the cerebellum are attached. If you didn't have this attachment, you can see the attachment. You see this, this big fiber tract here? If you didn't have that, the cerebellum would float off. It's not attached to the, um, to the medulla and it's not attached to the midbrain. It's attached only to the pons. This is a marriage that will never get a divorce. These two are attached. And this big circle that you can see here, this is called the basis pontus. It's the bottom of the pons. It's the part of the pons that is married to the cerebellum. These two are connected. So the more fine motor movements that you can make, the more coordinated movements that you can make, the more, the larger the cerebellum. And if the cerebellum grows, the, pon, the base of the pons has to grow. We have a nice robust one. It has this big outpouching, it's not subtle. There's a great case, um, some of you may have heard of, of a, a woman that was born without um, a cerebellum. There are about nine people known to have never, it, with a cerebellar agenesis, cerebellum never happened. And they also don't have a, a, a basis pontus. It's flat here. If you don't have a cerebellum, there's no need to build one of these. Okay, so, so we have hindbrain. This is the hindbrain, the trio of the hindbrain, cerebellum, medulla, pons. Here's the wedge that is the, um, that is the midbrain. And then here is the thalamus. And I'm a little bit off of, of midline. And so because I'm off midline, we can see into the subcortical part of uh of the um, telencephalon. And this is uh, the caudate. This is part of the, uh, of the striatum. So caudate and putamen are part, are, make up the uh, striatum. Okay, so now what we're gonna do, okay, that goes there, is we're gonna find the, exactly the same structures in a sheep brain. So here's a sheep brain. And once again, I mean, the, you, what you can see is there's a comb over. It's not quite as large because more of the cerebellum is, is visible. Here's the sheep's face. Back here is, this is spinal cord. So this is cerebellum. And this is um, the cerebrum. This is telencephalon. And a few things to note. One thing is that I never under I never realized until I looked at a sheep brain that the cerebellum is asymmetric. There's very little gross asymmetry in the brain, but this is one of the things that's asymmetric. It's asymmetric in us too, but in us, we have these enormous, actually, I'm gonna show you in us, we'll get a human brain out here too. Okay, so let's just compare the cerebellum of the sheep and the human. And you see this central part here in the sheep? You can't see it in the human because these lobes, these side lobes are so big, they've, they've folded out and you have to sort of separate them to find the vermis, the central part. So you can't see the, the, the asymmetry, but it's on the sheep, it's incredibly uh, obvious. Okay, do you see that? That this 
does not have a matching bit over here. Okay. All right, so now when I separate these two hemispheres, this is the left and the right hemisphere of the sheep brain. And I now we're gonna look down there, what are we gonna see? Anybody got a, an idea what we're gonna see? Um, we have a question of what accounts for the asymmetry in the cerebellum. Yeah, you can make up stories. It's the, the favorite story that we all wanna say is that it um, has to do with the asymmetry of the viscera because the vermis has it controls viscera as well as other um, as well as skeletal motor functions, but it's on the wrong side. So cerebellum is ipsilateral; it's on the same side as the part of the brain, a part of the body that it controls. The big piece of this is on the right, and we have our big asymmetry is on the left. So. So I got nothing. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Uh, so what do you think that we're gonna see when we look down here? Anyone? If you have any guesses, you can unmute or put them in the chat. Corpus closed. That's it. Beautiful and wonderful. There it is. You see that? Can you see that little white line going, be going between? them is it visible cassie um here let me so it's this i have to <laughs> yeah i think it's visible okay so what i'm gonna do is now i'm gonna cut this we have two brains so i can do do this do a couple different things we're just gonna make a mid sagittal cut and you're going to see that it's not that different from the the human so once again we have spinal cord medulla here's the pons and it's it's basically pitiful right here's the little basis pontus because it's it's connected to the cerebellum but look at how much smaller even relative the the cerebellum is. In particular, the cerebellum of the sheep does not have these wide lobes, these big lateral lobes that are so important for playing the piano and doing other things that we do with our, um, our digits. So this right here, this is called the aqueduct. It's part of the ventricular system and it marks the, the midbrain. Um, Ah, right here. Do you see this thing right here? Looks kind of like shape of a pineapple right there. Yeah. Okay, that is the pineal gland. Okay, that's the pineal gland. This is the pineal gland. That Descartes thought it was the seat of the soul. You know, good idea, but <laughs> no. Um, and so it marks the boundary between the midbrain and the diencephalon. And this part right here, this is vellum interpositum. This is the comb over. This is also part of the comb over, but this piece just between the pineal gland and the front end where the lamina terminalis, this is the vellum interpositum. Okay, so we have spinal cord, uh, medulla, and you can see the, the attachment of the spinal, of the, I'm sorry, of the cerebellum, and it's only attached. Look at how it's attached. It's only attached right here. We can, we can even take it off. Okay, that's the whole attachment. Boom, done. And the only place it's attached, if you look for the cut surface, it's this sur surface right here, and that's the pons. So that's the pons, and this is the medulla, and that's the spinal cord. Spinal cord, medulla, when you see that, that marriage, 
the attachment between the cerebellum and the hindbrain, you know you're in the pons part of the hindbrain. Then you get to the midbrain, which starts right here. These, are, these hills are, are called colliculi. They have very specific things that they do. They're part of the midbrain. And so is this, the pineal gland then marks the rostral end. So one of the things about this pineal gland is that it can get just the same way that the pituitary can get a tumor so can the pineal gland. And if it does, it grows big, 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 and it cuts off the circulation through the ventricular system and causes hydrocephalus. So this is a, this is a big problem. This can be a big problem. Okay. They, um, the sheep just does not have a remarkable mammillary body, but this is the, here's the cut to the, um, optic nerve, the eye would be here. You see a little indent where the orbit would be. Here's the optic nerve, it would go out here. And then this thing here is called the optic tract. So this piece here is thalamus, this is thalamus. And then this is all um, diencephalon. Here is the sheep's version of a corpus callosum. So between the corpus callosum and the roof of the diencephalon is the vellum interpositum. Okay. Um, I think what we'll do now is try to um, look a little bit at the internal structure of, of the sheep brain. So we've just cut off some top. And it was, a, it was a good place to cut it because what we came into is, um, is the ventricular system. So you can see this. And what we're gonna try and do is follow the ventricular system, which does a, a which, which has to basically provide um, support for the entire brain. Okay, so here we are. And I'm just gonna cut some of this off. Okay, now you see this, this cruddy stuff here. This, you see that cruddy stuff? Yeah. Okay, that is choroid plexus. That is gonna line the ventricular system and it's going to, it's a marriage between capillaries, which are peripheral, they're part of the circulatory system and the, a, a, choroid epithelium, which is a cuboidal epithelium that has, um, that, that is impermeable. And so basically the blood gets filtered through active transporters um, that are contained in the uh, cuboidal epithelium, the choroid epithelium. Together, these two things are called the choroid plexus. And this is going to pump out the cerebral spinal fluid that fills the ventricular system, okay? And we're gonna see that it, it just follows, we're gonna follow this down, down, down. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the beautiful, beautiful hippocampus. If I can do this right, we'll see a really pretty 
hippocampus. So you see that this is, is curving around. This is part of what we call the C structure. And um, it's, it's less C-ish in the, in the sheep and it's extremely C-ish in us. So there it is. That, my friends, is the hippocampus. That end there. Let's take this off so we can see it. So There it is. There's the end of it. You see how pretty that is? And it's all smooth because the hippocampus, or it, there's actually a fiber tract that, that sits on top of the hippocampus called the fimbria fornix. And that fimbria fornix is, forms one of the walls of, the, of this ventricle, which is called the lateral ventricle. And then the lateral ventricle also goes forward. And we can see that it, it you can see it up here too. And that's the, this is the rostral pole of it. And this is the caudate. And this is the fimbria fornix and the hippocampus. Okay, what else should we do? Um, any votes? Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so does hippocampus sit inside lateral ventricle? No, it, it formed, not it, but a, a um, it doesn't touch the lateral ventricle, but there's a, um, a layer of axons on top of, right, right, yeah. There's a layer of axons on top of the hippocampus and that forms the wall of the lateral ventricle in the, in the, in the temporal pole. In, so just, just to be clear, um, the sheep doesn't have this in the way that we have it, but if you look at a human brain, Remember that this is the front and this is the back. Well, the, the telencephalon did the big comb over and it still didn't have enough room. So it went forward. It sort of went around like a ram's horn and formed this thing, which is the temporal lobe. This is the temporal lobe. And that's where the hippocampus is. So the sheep has a little bit of it, but it's just not as, as well-defined. Okay, any other questions there? Any other questions? Uh, let's see, let me look at the chat. Um, oh, it, the top or the bottom wall? Uh, the, the bottom wall. So the, I, I pulled this out just because I think it's pretty instructive to see for a couple of reasons. The, ma the major reason this is instructive to see is that this is the, one of the big challenges of the brain is that it's in this cranium. It's in this bony vault. Here's the, here's the brain, here's the cranium. And this is a tough, you know, this is bone. Nothing's happening there. And if the brain swells, there is no forgiving. And so the, the pressure, that's why brain pressure, intracranial pressure is so, so important. If the intracranial pressure builds too much, the brain is not gonna work. 
It's not as though you get a bruise on your arm, your arm swells and who cares because there's no bony surround. Here you have this bony surround and if the brain swells, it's not gonna work because it's gonna run into the bone. The other thing that's kind of interesting right here is, this is the um, midbrain here. It's, a little, it's hard to see, but there, you, I don't know, you might be able to see a little bit of black here and here. Can you see that? I think so, yeah, you can see it. So that black is, um, is the substantia nigra. These are the dopamine containing cells uh, and they also have a, um, a substance called neuromelanin, which is black in color and un, you know, unstained. And so this is, uh, these are the cells that die in Parkinson's. Oh. Um, this thing here, I don't know if you can see this. There's a, this is the internal carotid right here and right here. You see that? We're looking at the bottom of the brain, right? Here's looking at the bottom of the brain and here are the internal carotids that come in. And the internal carotids, they, they bifurcate and they connect to this little thing here and that connects to these. But what you can kind of see here is that there's a circle. And this is called the circle of Willis. It's the only place in the human body where there is a, a circle of vessels. I think that's actually true. Um, if it's not true, there are not many other places. Anyway, this is called the circle of Willis. And the bottom line is that if you cut off, say this carotid, this carotid can serve the rest of the brain. It's not gonna do a fantastic job, but it's gonna, it's gonna keep you alive. It's gonna keep you conscious. Okay. Um, what um, I guess what we will um, try to look at the hippocampus in the human. Actually, what we'll do is we'll try to take off the cap. Try to take off the cap. Okay, so the lamina terminalis is right here. And I have to cut that to take off the cap. But then the only other place I have to cut is and I'm trying to tear it. I'm trying to tear the internal capsule. There we go. In general, when you dissect, tearing is much better than cutting. Now look at that. That is, in fact, that is the internal capsule. That's the thing that connects this. This is the thalamus. It's not a perfect dissection, but it's, it's not terrible. So what we have here is medulla, pons, basis pontus, cerebellum, married through this connection here. This connects to here. You can see the connection there. And then you get midbrain. And there's the inferior colliculi and the superior colliculi. These are the four, there are four hills, two on each side, inferior on each side, superior on each side. Uh, right about here would be the pineal, but it's probably on the other half of the brain. So we don't, we don't see it. Um, and so this, this wedge here is the midbrain, and then this is the diencephalon. 
that's it, that's it, that's it. And the, and here is the internal capsule. So this is the telencephalic cap. This is all telencephalon. This is all telencephalon and this is the rest of the brain. We are telencephalon. It's kind of cute. You can see that these are cut um, uh, axons. It's also kind of fun to, to follow the, uh, the corpus callosum. You can also see that. This is a sheet. I don't know if you can see this. I think I'm gonna to have to take, I'll have to take a wedge, which I will do. Take a wedge out. Oh. Okay, so you see, and if I, if I sort of peel back here, see that? I'm peeling axons. Can you see that those are all axons? Okay, you all see that? These are all just axons going across. This is all axons. There is not a cell body to be seen on a neuronal cell body anyway. Okay? Um, yeah. Can we see how internal capsule connects diencephalon to telencephalon? There it is. That's how it connects it. Uh, 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 uh. This is this is the internal capsule, and the, here it is. This is the diencephalon. This is telencephalon. That's the connection. Is there another question? Uh, it doesn't look like it. Any questions? Peggy. Yeah. Ramona's being shy, but she wants to know why pairing is better than cutting. Um. Because, so think about this, like look at these axons. And the only way to sort of go in the plane of the, of the tissue is to tear. If I cut, I, I mean, I, I'll cut wherever I, wherever I put my knife, I'll cut, but it won't follow the plane of the tissue. Um, I don't know, I, I got a head start on this stuff because when I was a kid, I used to do taxidermy. And when you do taxidermy, you really don't cut either. You do what's called blunt dissection. So that if you wanna follow the plane of tissue, you, you don't wanna cut ever. Yeah. Anything else you can think of, Yuri, that I should show? Not sure. Do you want to try to get your hippocampus there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so here is the lateral ventricle. You see that? We're a little bit off the midline, so we're in the lateral ventricle. And I'm just going to cut a window so that we see. Here's the front pole. That's the the frontal pole of the lateral ventricle. And now the lateral ventricle forms an actual, it, it's very Chicago because it forms a C with a spur, the same spur that the Chicago, University of Chicago and the Chicago Bears have. I think somebody told me the Cincinnati Reds also have it, but they got it from us, sure. So it kind of spurs back, here it is. Right there, okay, do you see that? Here's the back of it. This is the occipital pole. This is the back of the brain, this is the front of the brain. And you see that it's going around, it's gonna go around to the temporal pole over here, but it, throws back this spur so that it reach, so that the ventricle reaches the, this part of the brain, the occipital lobe. Does that make sense to people? 
And now again, just follow the, the plane of the um, tissue and This person has, okay, there's the hippocampus. It's not a great hippocampus. You see that? You see this? So here's, um, oops, where's my pointer? Um, front, back. Here's the frontal pole. We go around in the C and then we're down here. And this is the, is the hippocampus. This mound here is the hippocampus. It's not spectacular. It's a little bit diminished, which kind of makes sense. If you look at this brain, you'll see that the uh, sulci are, are a bit exaggerated. This is a typical thing that happens with aging is that you get some atrophy. You, the, you, these get accentuated because Basically, the person's losing cortical tissue. The brain is shrinking. And so it this to me looks to be, you know, somebody with some probably with some cognitive loss. And I mean, not 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 without memory, but starting to have some problems because that's a pretty small hippocampus. Okay, any other questions? We can also, we can, we might as well just, there, there is a role for taking sections. Actually, let's do sections on our other sheet brain. There is our other sheet brain. Um, so if you go to, the, if, you know, if, if life ever gets back to something resembling what it used to be on Friday mornings, there's brain cutting and it's, it's open to everyone and it's done in a very stylized way so that the, the brain is always cut in sections. Oftentimes, particularly if I go, um, Peter Pytel, who is our neuropathologist, will cut it in horizontal sections because that's fun to look at. But for right now, we're going to cut coronal sections. And what you can see here, so this is all telencephalon. We're, ahead, we're in front of the diencephalon. You can kind of tell that because here are the optic nerves. Those optic nerves mark the boundary. Um, here are the two lateral ventricles. And here, this lovely little white thing, this is sheep, remember? That's the corpus callosum in the sheep. Okay. All right. And now if we continue back, we're gonna hit the, the rostral end of the diencephalon. And we have, and one of the reasons I know is because that little slit right there, that's the third ventricle. That's the part of the ventricle that is present in the, uh, in the diencephalon. Um, this over here is lateral ventricle, as is this. And now, what is this? For all of those, for all of you that have been following this, what's this space right here? What do you think? Anyone want to shout it out? This is ventricle, lateral ventricle, lateral ventricle. This is all, here we have telencephalon. Here, down here is diencephalon. And the third ventricle, which is the part of the ventricle system in the in the diencephalon, what's this space right here? Velum That's it. That's the velum interpositum. This is the foldover. You have to have a diencephalon. When you're too far forward and there's no diencephalon, there's no 
fold over so you can't have vellum in your prism. But there's the fold over. And uh, by, by the way, this piece here, this thing, this is Dura. And it's the outermost of the um, membranes that surround the brain. Uh, the, those membranes are called meninges. This is Dura and it is tough. I can't pull it apart. Okay, you'd have to cut it. And right in here, in this little bit right here is the pituitary. It's in this little cavity there. But for right now, we're gonna take off the dura. And what we're looking down on is here's uh, telencephalon, here's diencephalon. And then at some point we get, ooh, look at that. Look at those hills. <laughs> that's kind of cool because that's another thing. That's another mystery that you see when you do these sheep brain dissections. This, these are, these two things here are called the superior colliculi. These ones are called the inferior colliculi. The superior colliculi in the sheep are enormous. They're basically the same size as they are in the human. Not same relative size, just same size. Here's the human superior colliculus. There's the sheep superior colliculus, pretty much the same size. And we're much bigger than the old sheep. So why? I don't know. I don't know. Superior colliculus is involved in um, orienting movements. So if somebody taps you on the shoulder, or there's a bright flash or a loud noise and you look at it, you orient towards it, you do that with the superior colliculus. And what do you see right there? What's that? Some kind of gland. Yeah, which one? It's on the back and here's the, here's the superior colliculus. This is part of the midbrain. So what gland is associated with the midbrain? Pineal. Exactly. Pineal gland is on the dorsal the back surface and it's associated with the midbrain, whereas the pituitary is on the ventral surface and it's associated with the diencephalon. So that's, that's the beautiful little um, pineal gland. The pineal gland is a gland. It's not part of the central nervous system. It's a gland that it happens to be housed in the cranium, but it's not neural. And I was once at brain cutting and it was super cool because we, we open up this, this um, brain and the pineal gland was bright green. And the reason it was bright green was because this person had um, high bilirubin and there's no blood brain barrier. So if you have high bilirubin, it's gonna get to the pineal gland. The brain's not green, but the pineal was totally green. It was really remarkable. Okay, so, so we have cerebellum, uh, a little pons, which is just, again, unremarkable. I think this is the pons, this is the medulla, here's the spinal cord, and here's the, um, somewhere in here is a little wedge of midbrain, which is midbrain's much wider on the top than it is on the bottom. Okay, so let's just take another slice. Woo. Now we're, this is midbrain. And how do we know? Because this thing here, that's the aqueduct. That's the ventricular system in the midbrain. The cerebral aqueduct. Here are the uh, lateral ventricles. Again, part the ventricular system for the telencephalon. And so the telencephalon has done its comb over. These two things are not actually attached. This is just connective tissue. This is just connective tissue. They're not attached. The only thing that attaches them 
is this structure, which is the internal capsule. This is the continuation of the internal capsule right here and right here. Otherwise, this would float free. Okay, so there you have a lovely piece of midbrain. Um, I'm going to try and slice this in half for a very specific reason. I might get lucky, I might not. Uh, no. Okay, so here, this is the back end of the diencephalon. Here is the, here are the lateral ventricles. This is a vellum interpositum here. The, this is called the pulvinar. Um, and this is, this is sort of, this is thalamus turning into midbrain. So I didn't get to do, see what I wanted to see, but such is life. Actually, we'll take a, a, a slice right through the, um, okay, so it, it, do I have, do I have ponds here? What do you guys think? Do I have ponds? No. No, what do I have? Am I? Yeah, this is medulla. And how do you know that it's not pons? Because it's not connected to the cerebellum. Because it's not connected to the cerebellum, exactly so. So here we have, um, actually, I'm going to cut this in half. OK, that's, that's lovely. So now we have. Here is this thing here is called the fourth ventricle. It's the ventricle system in the hindbrain. And here it is. This is pons. This part here is pons. And this part here is cerebellum. You see that this thing sort of dives down into the, um, into the ventricle. Well, they, they, the anonymous many centuries ago decided to call this, I think this is called the uvula. Anyway, there's a uvula, there's a tonsil, there's a nodulus. There's all these things that you find in the throat are renamed here in the cerebellum. But you can see here's this, the, pon, the, the medulla end and here's the pons end because it's actually connected. All right, is that clear to people? And oh, here we go. And so then Medulla. We're still in Medulla. And then finally, we're in spinal cord. Okay, which spinal cord is, is basically round and can't really see any structure there. What are the Friday morning brain slicing? Oh, it's, it's at the morgue, but you can't go anymore. So okay. You're gonna have to wait for COVID to resolve. Um, it, so what happens is that all the autopsies that are done at University of Chicago, they, um, they collect all those brains, they put them in fix, and they put them in fix for a week. So the autopsy is done in, in one week. Those brains are cut up the next week. As it turns out, not too many hospitals have the capacity to do autopsies and certainly not brain uh, pathology. So we are also we are also getting catchment from area hospitals. If they have um, an autopsy that they want done, or if they want a brain looked at, we'll get that. So we have a lot. We get a lot. There's usually I don't know. I'd say eight to ten brains, oh. and that's pre-COVID. So I have no idea what COVID has done to this. Yeah, I, I just don't know but um, it's closed now. But hopefully uh, sometime next year it'll reopen. We've come to the end of our time together. 
I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you now understand the parts of the brain. And I hope that demystifies neuroanatomy a little bit. The rest of it is commentary. If you understand that there's a hindbrain, a midbrain, a diencephalon, and then this hungry beast of a neocortex, which does a comb over over the rest of it, and that how that all fits within the cranium, then you're you're ready to go. You're ready for more. And I hope you want to learn more. And I hope to see you in a future video.